the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition's roundtable and meeting. So we have two parts to our meeting today. The first 45 minutes will be a panel of experts who are going to I think unofficially perhaps launch a review of the Charter of Human Rights and Principles of the Internet because we are celebrating its five year anniversary. The Charter began formally in 2009 with a, a, um, a crowdsourced drafting um, effort and gradually wound its way through many, many versions, many, many debates, all of which are on our list archives, into the version you see today, which is currently in five languages, with two more languages now officially underway, and we're very excited with our outcomes. But of course, in the time since the coalition itself began, which is 2008, and the Charter Project, we can call it if you like, the Net Rights Project, to encapsulate and to articulate the connection between international human rights law and norms, soft and hard law if you wish, and the whole internet governance discourse agenda setting and domain, the two things were very much in parallel. We have been helped in this work by events, some of which have been less than pleasant, but you can safely say that human rights for the online environment has come of age. Uh, at least in the last two years. But before we, we need to remember in this 45 minutes and the, and the short meeting that will follow, which I hope you all can stay for, that the reason it has come of age is because it has been nurtured, the seed has been planted, it has been watered, and it has been hopefully now harvested. And coming of age does not mean growing up. <laughs> so we're at a very important and exciting milestone with lots of things happening. So I'm going to introduce the panelists, which includes one, two, three members of the uh, draft, expert drafting group, who put together all our various drafts at the end of 2010 to come up with this beautifully written, elegant, legally authoritative and aspirational document that is currently serving three purposes. It is raising awareness, it is educating, and it's providing policy makers and lawmakers dealing with case law and existing laws around human rights for the online environment. It's providing them with a valuable framework that is also linking to other frameworks that have been coming out to think about the work we have ahead of us. So we have on my furthest right-hand side, Miriam Mazuki from Sorbonne University, who was a member of that committee and it goes back to the beginning and the roots of the coalition. We have next to her, uh, Riki Jurgensen, who was also a member of that expert drafting group. We have on my left-hand side, Dixie Horton, former chair, co-chair of the coalition. We have Robert Bodel on her left, who is currently the co-chair of the coalition along with myself. And we have, um, our honoured guests from Amnesty International, Sebastian Schroeder, the German um, section of Amnesty International, and Gabriella Guillemin from Article 19 in London. And they have kindly agreed to come and address certain textual, conceptual, and legal aspects as they see it of the current version of the Charter. So we're going to do a little bit of close reading, just for a little while, okay? Each uh, member of this panel for this next section will choose a particular section of the Charter. You can find it online if you wish to find it. Very easy, www, I believe it is www, internet rights and principles dot org. So you can click on the PDF if you want to follow mention of clauses. And we have lots of copies here. Well, not lots. We have some copies here. Thank you very much. I'd like to open, please, if I may, with Dixie Horton, who will need to leave us to go and join another exciting declaration that has been linked to the Charter work, but also has its own legs and its own relationship to its own region, the African Declaration. But before Dixie leaves us, I'd love to start with Dixie. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marianne. And um, I think five years of the Charter is a really quite amazing achievement um, for anyone who was at the workshop on the first day. Um, it was amazing to hear how many initiatives have come out of this work, um, how many initiatives that can be actually directly attributable to um, this work. I mean, I'm sure they will come up later today, but there's a Bill of Rights in, in New Zealand that's being looked at, that's coming out directly from the IRP. There's work at the Council 
Council of Europe um, on a human rights guide for internet users that comes directly out of the IRP. And as Marianne mentioned, I'm, I have to go for a launch of an African Declaration of Internet and Rights and Freedoms. And that one is really attempting to take this, um, this analysis that has been done about how international standards apply to the internet environment and turn it into a campaign for actual um, legal standards and for political support in, in the African region. Um, so I just wanted to reflect a little bit on a couple, well, I've just reflected a little bit on some of the um, achievements of the last five years. Um, and in the last year, especially with Marianne's and Robert's amazing work at um, having it translated and bringing it to new communities. And I wanted to bring my own reflections on what I think might be some of the next steps now. Um, uh, yeah. So the first, there's kind of two things which I think are really important. And the first thing is outreach and campaigning around the charter. It's really noticeable that at every single IGF I've been to, I've met people from countries all around the world who have who should be our core constituents there, civil society activists who are, or in other um, stakeholder groups who are committed to human rights on the internet and um, who should be kind of aware of this work and using it, it's a, it's a useful uh, tool for them. And a lot of them come up to me and have come up to me and said, you know, I wasn't aware of this. Why are we not aware of this? This is really useful. Um, material, this is useful work. Um, if I knew about this earlier, I wouldn't have had to do A, B, C, D, E analysis for myself. Um, and so I think that's one thing that we should really think about now. Um, how do we kind of get in those skills around education and outreach and campaigning to make sure that more people know about and can use the charter in their work? Um, the second thing that um, came to me when I was reflecting on the last five years was an idea which we had at the beginning and um, which had slightly fallen by the wayside, but which I think now might be a useful idea to reconsider. And the reason why I think it's a good idea is that we have this amazing document now and we really need to start thinking about implementation. We really need to start thinking about kind of how we can make sure that this isn't just aspirational ideas about what standards we want to see in the internet environment, but we really need to think about how we can make sure that this is happening in reality and that people's rights are being respected or that they're not being respected, that there is some kind of redress um, or some kind of, of mechanism. And um, so it I just remembered that at the beginning when we were talking about this, we also talked about a second section of the document which would go through each of the um, articles and think about what are the responsibilities for different stakeholders groups, for different sections within different stakeholder groups under those articles, um, and breaking that down as much as we can, like not just saying businesses, but let's go social networking groups, let's say hardworking group, hardware um, developers, software coders, and what would actually them incorporating the declaration, uh, the charter into their work actually mean for them. And as part of that work, doing some of the analysis again of international law to work out what are things which they are actually required to do. Um, and, you know, human rights uh, governments and businesses both have international legal responsibilities under human rights standards. So kind of trying to identify what those are. 
And at the same time, there are a lot of people in governments and many businesses who would like to go beyond that and kind of play their part to shape this field in an as positive and progressive manner as possible. So look at, but beyond what they're legally required to do, what could they do? What are, let's give them ideas, let's give the, the people working in the kind of corporate social responsibility departments in these, in these companies ideas about how they could actually push this agenda. What things could they be considering and I think the Charter is an extremely useful starting point for that because it's so broad it's not just freedom of expression it's not just privacy it's not just kind of network neutrality but we're also looking at economic and social cultural rights we're also looking at kind of um, governance mechanisms which are necessary and so by using this framework we can be really comprehensive and I'm really sorry I have to go because <laughs> I'm sure it's going to be a really fascinating discussion and I hope that those ideas are useful. And thank you very, very much, Marianne, for doing such an incredible job. And before Dixie goes, I would like to extend a huge um, thank you to her. She has served on the steering committee after her term as co-chair and I omitted the fact that Dixie was also the editing, the managing editor of the of the charter text, so she was part of the team. So I'd like a large round of applause to Dixie as she steps down from the steering committee to pursue other life paths. So I'd like to say thank you, Dixie. And so while you're here, well, we want to say thank you while you're here, not when you're not. Okay, let's go. So with that in mind, I think we have, I have, or we have, I think I can find that implementation file in one of my uh, folders on my computer, so we might, we'll bring it out and readdress it. So that was a very important beginning. I'd like to move now to Miriam. Yeah, thank you, Marianne. Um, you know me, I don't like to follow the rules and or be constrained or be uh, placed inside the frame, so I didn't pick up a, a single specific uh, provision of the, the charter, but I would like rather to, to address the charter as a whole. Um, first of all, I would be tempted to say that there is nothing to change in the in the charter uh, because it is uh, technologically neutral, and this is very important. That uh, even with the uh, uh, development of uh, maybe other technologies, other services, other applications, the uh, charter as it is is still uh, applicable. So this is uh, a really good point about. The, the charter. Uh, second reason uh, that I, for which I would say there is nothing to change is that, uh, as Dixie also uh, uh, said, that it presents a, a really holistic uh, vision of uh, human rights. It uh, includes uh, first generation, second generation, and even third generation rights with the right to development, which is um, something that we see very seldom uh, uh, including in civil society discussion uh, in the space of the IGF so I'm very happy uh, that um, there is this uh, holistic vision of uh, human rights re represented in the charter but of course it's not uh, a perfect document document it is even uh, far from uh, perfect and there is still a long way and a lot of uh, work to do uh, to improve it uh, in in particular, uh, what I see um, as uh, one of um, an important weakness of the Charter as it is now in this uh, version is that uh, most of the provisions uh, merely state uh, or announces a, a, a given right, explain uh, how it, trans it translates on the internet, but um, it is very much similar uh, to the uh, UDHR, the Universal Declaration of uh, Human Rights in its form as it is uh, rather declarative of, of a right and this was done on purpose for this uh, a version of the Charter as a first step. We needed to do this kind of first translation in the online environment, in the, uh, the environment. 
so to uh, go ahead a little bit with the comparison in form with the UDHR, uh, then we have we have the UDHR, then we have treaties, um, international conventions, and we have also national and, uh, and regional uh, regulations that are dealing with uh, the, the specifics. But in our case, uh, with regard to the charter, we don't have uh, really um, uh, implementation uh, uh, development yet, except as already mentioned, as a first step, the Council of Europe Guide for Internet Users, and uh, um, in many aspects, uh, it is uh, probably much less declarative than the Charter, so it's a good um, advance, uh, in addition to the fact that this guide, uh, this Council of Europe Guide uh, on human rights of internet users, it's the first institutionalization uh, process of a work done by a dynamic coalition here, the, um, the IGF. So to, to um, summarize this uh, point, I would say that uh, we will need to uh, provide practical answers to practical questions uh, any internet user might have, not uh, simply individuals, but also uh, groups, organization, uh, companies, whatever. A uh, second point uh, in which the charter could uh, be improved uh, is with regard to the right to uh, remedies. And uh, I know that uh, Ricky will talk more, more in detail about that, so I'm only mentioning uh, uh, this point. Uh, a third point is that uh, since the internet is to, to a greater extent a privately ordered space, the charter does not, in my opinion, adequately uh, target uh, r human rights uh, also vis-a-vis -vis, uh, private uh, companies, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, corporations. And I think in the next step we uh, should use, like we use the UDHR itself as a, as a point of, of departure, for next version we probably should uh, rely on the RUGI principle pulse on uh, business and human rights. Uh, and I think this should constitute a, a good source for uh, a revision of the charter, especially uh, with uh, respect to this uh, privately ordered uh, specificity. And finally, my final point on uh, the improvement that could be made is that uh, a next version maybe uh, should um, adequately address the, the issue of the uh, conflicts of uh, jurisdiction. This issue uh, has been around uh, for more than 15 uh, years and it is still not uh, resolved as I um, as I said in other uh, workshop this uh, this morning, uh, first of all, if we consider, for instance, uh, freedom of expression, there are conflicts of jurisdiction in the different uh, parts of the world, data protection and privacy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is uh, again, in my opinion, the, this issue of the conflict of jurisdiction is the main. The the core issue that should be solved uh, when we talk about internet uh, governance. So I will stop here and uh, there is a lot of work to do. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam, and also thank you for the, all the work that you also did at the time and continue to do. Very important points. I hope the full transcript can be made available so that we can refer to it. We also have a live blog on internet rightsandprinciples.org, which will give you a fairly faithful rendition of today's conversations with our brilliant live blogger, Catherine Easton. So if in case the live transcript goes down, which has happened in the anonymity panel, you can refer to the live blog and get some idea uh, to reflect on. I'd like to now turn to Ricky Jönsson. Uh, thank you very much. He's from, um, I forgot to say where people, did, Ricky, did I say where you were based? Uh, I'm sorry. The Danish Institute for Human Rights, is that correct? Thank you, Ricky. Also a member of the original drafting group. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining so late in the afternoon. 
So if we go back, I know with this session we're supposed to look forward, but in order to go forward, I want us to look back a bit. And when this work was initiated and really evolved five years ago, a lot of us was, was very concerned with, with translating existing, well-established human rights standards to an online context. That was really the thing that a lot of people within this community were struggling with. We don't want new rights, but we want to have existing established human rights um, translated and understood within this new context. Since then, a lot, of, a lot has happened. Um, Notably, we've had several resolutions uh, by the UN General Assembly that didn't exist back then. Uh, and we have recently, just a few months back, a, a huge report by the UN High Commission on Human Rights on, on Privacy and Surveillance uh, in the Digital Age. So really, the, the way that human rights uh, have now been translated to this context by various international organizations is completely different than when this work was started. Um, and one of the things that I've really been thinking about for the past two days here and also inspired by the, by the session that you opened with, um, was it yesterday morning or the day before? Uh, a workshop 83, yeah. is that correct? That was Tuesday morning. It was Tuesday morning, so already two days ago was that where I think the really interesting part is now and where we need to move forward is not anymore so much the translation of human rights into a digital context, but it's much more the translation um, of these standards to a national level. So the, the, the issues that people are struggling with in terms of using the guide uh, and other, um, other competing documents in their national context. And I mean, I, th I think the session on Tuesday really gave a lot of examples of how it can be utilized by, in parliamentary processes, by civil society groups, being used in teaching curricula around the world. And I think all these experiences from national level, how it feeds into advocacy or legislative uh, proposals or uh, teaching at universities or primary schools, we need to make that much more visible and accessible within this platform, um, uh, something that people can really draw from, from the initial work that, that, the, that the charter itself represents. So that's, and that's also touching upon what Miriam said on, on, on implementation and making more visible and accessible these experiences, these struggles at national level. Um, I think that's an important point as we move forward. Then another important point that has already been mentioned is access to an effective remedy. I was also partaking in the work done by Council of Europe on a guide on internet users rights. That's a little bit similar to this uh, project, but it's also a bit more narrow in scope because it's more uh, European focused. It's, it's, a, it's a guide that's adopted by the um, 47 uh, Council of Europe member states, so it has, it has government's uh, commitment to it to a certain extent, and it's very much based on case law from the European Court of Human Rights. One of the things we discussed a lot in that work and that we didn't discuss that much five years ago was actually the, the issue of access to effective remedies, which is an established part of, of international human rights law, but doesn't figure very prominently in this work. And I think that's another theme that we really, I mean, maybe the most important cross-cutting theme that we need to develop as we move forward, because increasingly I think that's what people are really occupied with in relation to these rights. The struggle is not so much more anymore whether there is a formal recognition of having these rights applying online, but rather a huge frustration that it's so difficult to enforce your rights. And the, the, um, the various institutions that you have to uh, address or go through in enforcement ranging from, from state the states as the primary duty bearer with regard to, to human rights obligations, and then the whole private sector that plays a crucial role uh, in the online sphere and are increasingly themselves also speaking to their human rights responsibility. And really tabbing into that discussion and increasingly discussing what does access to an effective remedy apply 
in relation or, or contain in relation to, to these rights in an internet context. I think that's, that's one point where we really need to, uh, to move forward. Um, so that's, that's a cross-cutting theme. Related to that is the role of, of business, the role of private sectors. Um, the Rocky Guidelines, as, as Mariam mentioned, is an important standard setting document that didn't exist five years ago either. Um, that is really quite strong now. We've actually just, at my institute back home, the Danish Human Rights Institute, we've just done an issue paper on the, the state responsibility vis-a-vis -vis private companies and how, how far can you take the state responsibility to protect human rights in terms of what they have to do uh, with regard to companies. Uh, okay, so my time is out. I'll mention one last theme and that's surveillance. Surveillance is also a bit under uh, addressed, I think, in, in, in the current version. Thank you. I'm sorry to cut you off, Ricky, I really am. Um, surveillance, you're right, surveillance is indeed under, in most of our concerns, a new issue. However, the Charter did foresee surveillance as an issue, and we have addressed surveillance, however, cursorily. So uh, I take that invitation certainly to heart myself. And Ricky, you've uh, suggested where the Charter ends is where we next need to begin. Clause 20, duties and responsibilities of power holders. So moving on, before we... Um, we need to move on now to our two guests. Just to recall, at the start of this project, to articulate these concerns, and as we look at them five years on, we were at the time very concerned about the sort of work for the international human rights community. And in that regard, we were thinking of Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International's work, Article 19, and these NGOs who fight human rights defenders in the offline world. And now we know all too well that online, these things are just as pressing. So I have a great pleasure in introducing the first of our two guests from the international human rights community, as we understood it then, uh, Sebastian Schweder from uh, Amnesty International. Thank you for being with us, Sebastian, and forgive me in advance if I have to give you the 30-second card. It's okay. Um, okay. Um, thank you uh, very much. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm, I really appreciate to be here today. Um, my talk will be about, because I, uh, I decided to uh, stick to the instructions and um, get very much into, uh, into the details of one uh, specific provision. Um, my talk will be about um, Article 21, Clause B. That's uh, limitations on rights and the Charter, um, which in my view is one of the most central provisions of the Charter because it uh, basically concerns all rights enshrined uh, in, in the IRP Charter, um, th as they all are not guaranteed without limitation. Um, uh, of course, I will um, put a focus on um, uh, specific, um, specific rights, or specific rights, Article 9 and 8, uh, Article 8 and 9, um, privacy and data protection. Um, but um, it's very much like uh, the. Um, like uh, the uh, uh, Charter of Fundamental Rights of the uh, European Union, um, there's just one single provision covering all human rights in terms of their susceptibility, susceptibility to uh, limitations. Um, and that's different from uh, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, for example, um, or the ICCPR. Um, okay, so uh, when it comes to the right to privacy laid down in Article uh, 8, uh, there is uh, a specific clause uh, when it comes to surveillance um, that I would like to mention, um, that's uh, clause F. Um, that's the right to be free from arbitrary surveillance and, uh, or interception particularly um, mentioned therein. And then there is a right to the protection of personal data in Article 9, uh, giving every person the right to control the collection and use of their personal data. Uh, by others and make them subject to an informed consent under Clause B. And also Clause C requires the data processors to keep the collection of data to the minimum amount and time necessary and to delete them when they are no longer necessary. And lastly, Clause D says that um, independent 
data protection authorities should be established to monitor compliance with these rules. So um, in this regard, we have a basic set of rules that is comparable to Article 8 of the, um, uh, of the Charter and fu Fundamental Rights of the EU. Um, on the other hand, uh, there is the right uh, to security in Article 3. Uh, and from the very wording, uh, this right appears at first sight to be more of a restriction to other human rights than a proper right in itself. Um, so uh, uh, the right to security um, mentions a duty to protect against all forms of uh, 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 crime on uh, uh, using the internet. Um, but it cannot go beyond what is recognized in other uh, human rights uh, uh, instruments. So uh, Article 3 is a, is a right of its own, um, as the clauses A and B demonstrate. Uh, it's a human right that may be in conflict with other human rights of the Charter. And it provides a specific rules on, on, uh, on how to reconcile this, uh, the conflict between uh, uh, freedom and security, basically. Um, so if I were to make a proposal or, or, or a set of proposals on how uh, the difficult relationship between privacy rights and the right to security should be balanced in a more detailed way, um, I would say, first of all, um, Articles 9 and 8 are already very specific. But there are, of course, some refinements that I think could be done um, and that could really give this charter kind of a, a pioneer role in some respect. Um, um, I, will, I will present uh, some details on this now, but I would like to clarify from the beginning that um, some important groundwork has already been done by others, um, which I, I think that can influence the further review um, of the Charter. Um, and the, my, my f uh, first uh, a proposal in this regard would, like, um, would be uh, to have a look at the international principles on the application of human rights to communication surveillance, um, also known as the unnecessary and proportionate principles. Um, I think they have certainly contributed to specify um, the particular, uh, particular principles and safeguards that need to apply when analyzing the lawfulness of a given surveillance mechanism. Um, I have a feeling that this work should really get more attention also by uh, legislators and decision makers and I would be happy to um, stay in contact uh, um, with you in that. And secondly, uh, I would uh, invite you to have a look at the African Declaration for, for free Internet Rights and Freedoms um, that's being launched us now. That's why Dixie Harton is not here. Um, the draft featured two long principles, one on privacy and the other one on surveillance. That uh, sounded very interesting to me. Uh, and the final text only contains one principle on privacy uh, and is way shorter but is uh, detailed in, in uh, kind of an annex uh, with more detailed explanations. Um, and I thought they're very worth reading, um, particularly for one reason, um, uh, because uh, I think uh, the Charter should clarify that mass surveillance can never be a proportionate measure um, and will always amount to violation of the right to privacy um, and as the case may be also the right uh, to personal data protection. Um, and this is also the essence of the Pillai report um, on the right to privacy in the digital age that has been published in uh, a couple of, uh, oh, I'm, I've got one minute left, okay. <laughs> That's a little bit more generous. Um, so uh, in the end, only targeted surveillance can be proportionate in the first place, and I think we, we should um, probably incorporate that in uh, the Charter. Uh, secondly, I believe there is an urgent need to uh, more clearly define the exceptions where surveillance um, or an interference with these uh, rights may be acceptable, and what could be a legitimate aim in this regard. Um, if we think that the remaining conditions like necessity and proportionality are fulfilled, um, there can be legitimate aims like, um, you know, the fuzzy buzzwords like national security, public safety, um, crime prevention, crime detection, investigation, prosecution, all this stuff. And as a first step, I would propose to include these terms in the Charter to clarify what in abstract terms can be legitimate aims for an interference here, um, what, what these terms are. And the next step would then um, be to give uh, definitions of these notions and uh, so that we can know what is actually me meant by uh, 
yeah, uh, the national security exception, for example. I think this is a very uh, the, the um, most important one. Um, and I think it should be recognized that this is a sensitive issue. It goes to the very heart of states' integrity. But um, uh, there are uh, there is a need to to de define this more clearly. Uh, I think also in an, on an international level. Okay, so um, I think my time's uh, uh, more or less up. So <laughs> my last point would be um, make the um, charter a binding document for all actors involved. Um, because if we are to apply a multi-stakeholder approach uh, to internet governance, we may not leave these stakeholders with a leeway to decide how far their rights and duties go. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sebastian. I see that you have actually got a text there. Will we be able to use the text of your intervention as part of our record keeping? Would that be okay? You send it to us and we put your text. That's brilliant. So uh, thank you. A binding document. Gosh, the sky is the limit. Okay. Um, I'd like to now move, thank you very much. I'd like to now move to Gabriella Guimain from Article 19. Thank you very much, uh, Gabriella. Thank you very much, Marianne, and thank you very much for inviting Article 19 uh, to this round table and giving us an opportunity to um, discuss the, the Charter with you today. Uh, first of all, I'd like uh, to uh, express uh, Article 19's, you know, how we share the views uh, that have been expressed by Mariam and Rike about all the positive features uh, of the Charter and uh, the various plans to, to move uh, this document forward and in particular uh, looking at implementation. I thought I would just offer a couple of comments um, and in particular that usually when you're lo looking at soft law or uh, legal instruments such as um, the uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, uh, when you're looking at implementation usually you're looking at a body that can monitor uh, that implementation at international level. Of course, it's very important that it's also taken into account at the national level, but um, um, I think it's a consideration to, to bear in mind. I think it's, um, the, the, the Charter is really a, a great endeavour in that it's actually trying to cover all the different rights that are scattered around very different treaties uh, under international law, So, uh, which means that in, in looking at how uh, they are to be applied on a more practical level, it's obviously um, an even greater task. So here I'd like to, to point to a, a number of endeavors um, by a number of civil society organizations and how to develop certain aspects of those rights that are in the Charter. So um, I think, um, sorry, what's your name? Sebastian. Sebastian, I'm sorry. Sebastian has already mentioned the necessary and proportionate uh, principles um, which uh, explain how international human rights applies to communication surveillance. There are other initiatives. Uh, Article 19 uh, worked with others to develop principles on how to balance freedom of expression and copyright in the digital age. Um, there were a number of roundtables and discussions today about how to develop a basic framework for intermediary liability. So I think that moving forward, there will be a lot of initiatives to draw from or other people to work with in looking at how these rights can be implemented in, in practice. Secondly, um, uh, I would like to offer some comments um, in relation to uh, the Charter itself and perhaps make some suggestions to strengthen the Charter as an advocacy document. And um, those suggestions are mainly twofold. Um, on the one hand, I think um, the, the language of the Charter should follow more closely um, in certain respects, but I'll come to that, uh, the language of international instruments. And uh, secondly, I think it would be worth looking at reviewing the document for internal consistency and tightening up uh, the language in places. So what I'm going to be uh, looking at very briefly now is um, the provisions that are related to the right to freedom of expression, which is um, my area of expertise. Um, looking at Section 5, uh, which lays out uh, freedom of expression and information on the internet, for instance, um, there is a section dealing with freedom of online protest. And Article 19 is currently involved in work around uh, international principles on the right to protest. And so we had a gathering with a number of experts around the world 
And what we discovered is that the term is actually hugely contested. So although we can see that it is helpful to, to have this pr provision here, um, this is something which is actually not necessarily widely agreed on uh, internationally, which, in, which may need to be revisited in light of uh, further work in, in this area. Um, uh, secondly, uh, in, in the same um, uh, section on, on freedom of expression, there, there is a, a subsection about freedom from censorship. And here, obviously, as a, as a free speech advocate, um, we want uh, freedom of expression to be protected around the world. However, we know that uh, freedom of expression uh, uh, is, um, is not an absolute right and can be uh, limited. So here, um, in that section, for, for, for me, I see a language which is not entirely clear. Um, so for example, there's a reference to um, uh, measures that are designed to intimidate internet users, and immediately I think about cyberbullying, which is uh, an issue that comes up a lot um, uh, in, the, in the digital space. But in many countries, uh, for instance, uh, bullying is, is not an offense. So how is it, what kind of measures exactly um, are we uh, talking about, especially if you know, censorship is, is, is tolerated? So it, it's not clear necessarily uh, where the censorship comes from. Are we talking about state? Are, are we talking about censorship by private users? Um, f further on, there's a reference to um, freedom from blocking and filtering. And again, um, I don't particularly like um, uh, blocking at all. And in fact, we're very much against mandatory uh, filtering of internet content. But then when we look at um, international standards that have been developed in this area, such as the Joint Declaration uh, on the Freedom of Expression and the Internet by the Special Mandates on Freedom of Expression, um, they do not say that blocking uh, is never permissible. Uh, it is in fact permissible in certain very narrow circumstances, for instance in relation to child pornography. But one of the crucial features is that it has to be ordered by a court. Um, but it, it, it's not necessarily something you would get from, uh, from reading the, the, the section um, in the charter. I will just flag up um, a, a couple more uh, areas where um, you know, some tightening um, may be worth looking at. Um, there is a section about freedom of online uh, uh, association assembly. Uh, and again, um, there's a, a right to form, join, meet, or visit the website or network of an assembly group or association for any reason. Uh, although it is true, um, of course, that everyone can get access to websites, one question that springs to mind is what happens when uh, is ISIS or some other uh, terrorist group that uh, is joining together or some other form of um, organized crime, how, how do we deal with that? And that brings me to another point uh, around the general clause on the limits on, on, on the various rights in the Charter, which I, I think may have been a, a, a simple um, oversight, but it refers to um, the various limits on the international law, which are uh, any restriction must be uh, provided by law um, pursue a legitimate aim and be necessary and proportionate to that aim. Um, unfortunately, the term uh, provided by law does not feature uh, in that section, which is um, a very a crucial um, safeguard because even though a measure may be uh, clearly, de restrictive measure may be clearly defined, um, what's really important is that um, it is provided by law as a guarantee against the abusive exercise of power. So I'll stop here, but I hope that these uh, suggestions will be useful in the further work uh, around the Charter. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. Invaluable input. I was just wondering if there were, there were any remote participants. Is there any remote participation? Is there anyone wanting to speak on remote? Okay, right. Thank you. Just checking. Um, I'd like that to very briefly. There will be time for some comments from the floor. We do want to do a little bit of um, wrapping up, summing up, and a little bit of information about election of new officers. So bear with us. Um, Robert Bodle, any final comments and anything you want to focus on before we move to the next phase? Thank you, Marian. Um, very um, 
grateful for the contributions made already today. I'm not a legal expert. I'm not a lawyer. Um, so I'm very nervous about um, messing with uh, uh, the existing text. Um, and I know great care was taken to uh, transcode the UDHRs to the network digital sphere, not to weaken existing rights and not going beyond existing rights. Um, my main interest is uh, Clause 8, or Article 8, Clause E, uh, anonymity, the right to anonymity and to use encryption, but also uh, other aspects of the right to privacy. And I just wanted to touch on Miriam's uh, point about technologically neutral, that we've achieved uh, the t that kind of uh, status. Um, I do see a tension uh, with keeping up with potential violations that are based in technology, uh, but also nervous about naming different specific technology because then it wouldn't be technologically neutral. Um, so I do notice there are some specific technologies that are listed here, and I wonder, I'd just like to ask the experts um, whether, for example, at the, at the top, digital signatures, usernames, passwords, PIN and TAN codes, uh, if we want to keep that or if we want to build upon it or... Yes, this is true. Um, by the way, there are copies of the charter at the front of the room. Some of you are probably wondering what we're referring to. Yes, this issue about um, naming particular tools and platforms that at the moment and at the time are very current, but of course very quickly can become uh, ob not so much obsolete, but so last week. And that is, uh, that is a real issue. Um, uh, Kasper Bowden has been uh, engaging in some interesting debate on Twitter about the fact that the charter is te technologically neutral. Um, uh, I, for one, have said to him, well, it isn't really, but it sort of is, but uh, not in the way he understands it. So the question is, how do you encapsulate technolo technological developments mm -hmm. without getting stuck into the time box that then makes you out of date as soon as the next tool is available? So just wondering very briefly, if there are any comments from the floor about that, or if any of the panel would like to comment. Um, we were being confronted, of course, with, as things were five years ago, TAN codes, PIN, you know, social, so, global brand names that might make us blush in a few years if we put them in our documents. I'm not sure. Any comments about how to approach the, the, the need to stay current in the language and yet not to be tied down to a particular brand or uh, generation of technology? First Ronnie and then... So, oh, sorry. Hi. Can you hear me? Yep. Is this on? Yep. Um, excuse my bad voice. Uh, I'm Ronnie Coven. I'm the acting director of the World Press Freedom Committee. I went to the Magna Carta session earlier today to see how it relates to the Charter, and I found that they don't really compete since they seem not to have a text. The Charter has the virtue of existing, and I agree with eight-tenths of it. But I have problems with two sections, in particular of the Charter. The first one is freedom from hate speech. You know the U.S. First Amendment objection. One person's robust generalization is another's hate speech. Were the Danish cartoons of Mohammed hate speech, aside from whether or not they were a good idea. I won't dwell on that well-known debate in what most of us, most of you would undoubtedly see as a perverse form of American exceptionalism, except to say that I wouldn't want to be in the position of saying, for example, that Germany shouldn't ban neo-Nazi speech. I square that circle by invoking the notion of a clear and present danger to justify a speech ban in that case. The other problem that I have may be less obvious. It's over whether privacy is or should be a right. If it's a right, it's a perverse one. It's been used as a code word to stifle legitimate news reporting. The UK government has had to decree a journalistic exception mm. 
the data protection rules for that reason. The right, the controversial right to be forgotten is a species of right to privacy. And it is causing no end of, dile of dilemmas uh, from a freedom of expression viewpoint. The right to privacy is not historical or traditional. Its origin is American. It was invented by the U.S. legal philosopher Louis Brandeis in a famous Harvard Law Review article at the turn of the 19th century. And there are a number of distinguished legal scholars who can contest the wisdom of what Brandeis actually called the right to be left alone. Those, those are my, my two basic uh, comments. But some of the other earlier comments I thought were also very judicious. Okay, thanks, Ronnie. I appreciate, well, we all appreciate your input. Thank you very much. We have another comment where time is flying. Uh, first we're there and then Charles. So could you please uh, just state your name and your affiliation for the sure. record? David Hughes, Recording Industry. Um, we have, to address the question that you asked to the floor, we have um, had this challenge in um, so many drafting sessions over the past couple of decades. And I, I think the answer is fairly obvious, or maybe it's not, and that is to just describe the intention very clearly with the functionality and avoid reference to any specific technology. It seems to me that every time we refer to a specific technology, we, re we end up regretting it. Point taken, thank you. Uh, Charles McCarthy Neville, Yandex, exactly what David said. That's the only way to do it. Um, and, and it is important to do that. Every time you put in an example, a huge proportion of your readers read that example as an exhaustive list. It's just, you, you can't afford to you know, helpfully give something, unfortunately. The, there's a piece that I f find difficult, I think, in the, in the right to remedy. There's a, a piece that no one's mentioned, which is about understanding what laws and, and remedies apply to you. And, and I'm, you know, it's something I don't see very much in this discussion. But, but as a person living in a particular society with a particular set of rules and mores and conventions, I think there's uh, an idea in my head that, that I expect to know what kind of laws are, are applicable to me. And that's really, really problematic in, in practice. You know, knowing who I'm dealing with is a part of it. I don't have a, a clearer uh, explanation of it than that at the moment. Thanks, Charles. Uh, important point. You know, the, the slogan, know your rights, is a great start, but know how to actually have your rights supported and protected is the next step. So education, education, education. <laughs> um, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap this up a little bit unless there's some burning comments from the floor about, the, about our discussion. We like to keep it going. Um, we will be uh, now, please stay with us. It's not that boring. It's the meeting. I'm going to sum up very briefly, orally, what we have achieved this year in light of this fascinating discussion. I'd like to thank all our panelists for, for spending their energy and time in focusing once again on the wording and to give you all a sense of the kind of work that was done. Can you imagine? the sort of discussions that we've had and we all learn from. So at this point, I'd like to just segue 
to the former opening of the face-to-face -face meet space annual general meeting of the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition. And I simply want to take the next two minutes to sum up orally. We will be, Robert and I, um, putting up online a written, more written report. This is what you need to do so that people know what you have been doing. The dynamic coalitions are part of the IGF. They are, at least in principle, a constituent hub uh, or space where different players, actors, and interested parties can come together to generate an interest, a space and a platform around a particular interest. Now, the dynamic coalitions themselves have a fluid existence. The Internet Rights and Principles Coalition, through the charter work, has managed to sustain its efforts over five years and between many internet governance forums and other sorts of meetings. So the main, the main output has been the charter booklet, which has allowed people to get a hold of the charter itself, which was the material we were addressing today in the context of the coalition work and other issues. So we have managed to translate it into other languages and continue to do so. But what we have discovered is that the booklet in its printed form has been an enormously helpful um, output because it allows people to hang on to something. Some people want it digital, it is digital, it's all online, but many people want something next to their desk, um, you know, sort of tuck under their pillow at night maybe. <laughs> um, to actually have it to look at. And digital is good, but printed matter is also good. Of course, there are environmental issues. And we have discovered the booklet to have been an enormous, um, enormous success, and it continues to be. But the coalition has also been working with outreach. It has been working with the Guide to Human Rights and, uh, from the Council of Europe and other dynamic coalitions, and we wish to keep that going. Um, and just let me look at my list. So. The implementation, as you know from Workshop 83, just very quickly, we have the charter and the coalition model of working with principles and consultation being brought into directly the political process in New Zealand by an Internet Rights and Freedom Bill. We've had the Marcos Seville pass legislation in Brazil, a sister and companion project all along with key uh, members of that uh, initiative in the steering committee. We have had... Um, the IG MENA campaign in the Middle East and North African region, take our very official looking version and translate that into um, graphic designs and language that ordinary people can actually connect with because we're talking very much in legal institutional language. So there's been amazing work being done by the IG MENA HIVOS project. So there's a lot of work we can do to actually make this material more accessible and still continue our, our detailed legal and expert driven discussions. We sometimes forget we're speaking a certain language here and not everybody can access that. So that's all been that's all been happening this year. We also made a significant contribution to the Net Mundial. Everybody made a significant contribution to Net Mundial consultations. Uh, we, but we know for sure as people have been telling us that the internet the human rights the Charter of Human Rights and Principles for the Internet. And our 10 principles, which were distilled from the Charter, have actually been formative parts of the Net Mundial document, and I think uh, that's fairly evident. And just on a very simple matter, we're nearly at 1,000 on Twitter. Woo! -hoo. So we're nearly reached four figures. Now, this is significant, I think. Um, there are issues about what sort of social media we use, but the fact is that Internet governance discussions and debates are increasingly on Twitter, and uh, we're very excited with the sort of quality of the tweets and conversations we're having on the, the feed. So counting by numbers is not our only rate of success. So we're going to step forward. And how we're going to step forward is that, like any loose association, we do have a sort of governance structure. And the governance structure has been for the last two or three years since the Nairobi uh, Internet Governance Forum is to have a rotating co-chairship, a staggered co-chairship. So the co-chairs stand uh, co-chairs for two years, elected, if not elected, because if it's not contested, that's not strictly an elected, but to be supported by a polling process online, and we manage this every year. Um, I am the now stepping down after my two-year tenure as co-chair, and following the staggering, I will then sit on the steering committee as a former co-chair. Uh, Robert Bodle has one more year to go, and we actually have... Uh, uh, co-chair candidate, I believe, someone who may wish to stand. I'm not sure if they want to present their candidature right now, but I'm now actually going to officially hand the meeting over to Robert Bodle, because my time is up. 
Oh, thank you so much, Marion. I want to thank Marion uh, for all of her work for the last two years. Uh, I'd like to thank the steering committee members. I'd like to thank all the participants on the listserv. I'd like to thank all friends of the Internet Rights and Principles. Um, we still have a lot of work to do, so I think I'll just uh, close with a couple of things that I'd like to see. Um, and then we should talk about maybe process. Okay. Um, should we talk about process first? Up to me. All right. Um, so in the next uh, week, we'd like to people to nominate uh, themselves uh, for the steering committee. Uh, we will put up a, um, a survey tool on the listserv, so join up with the listserv and then uh, we'll also announce it on our website uh, to join the IRP in the steering committee and we'll have some uh, qualifications for that. Uh, read your emails, respond to them, uh, and um, get behind the charter and work with other dynamic coalitions uh, under the IGF. Um, I'm excited, uh, so, so that's part of the process, and then we will probably take three weeks to, uh, to have the vote in, uh, so that everyone can vote that's within the DC, um, the Dynamic Coalition listserv. So we will get that up and we'll send an announcement on the general list for that. I'm really excited about growing the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition. This is a moment now uh, to join this coalition. It's really moving forward. Um, so, a couple of things, points of order. Um, what I'd like to uh, to do, I'd like to thank uh, the uh, Pirate Party Movement of Turkey. Um, I'd like to thank individuals like uh, Birchu and uh, Sirhat Coach and Selin and others. Um, and I want to announce that they have a uh, workshop uh, that's, which is a, a IRPC with Freedom House and the Turkish Pirate Party tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Uh, online freedoms and access to information online. We also have a taking stock meeting tomorrow um, and we can raise issues uh, such as it looks like uh, one of our workshops was uh, was edited quite quite severely on YouTube uh, from an hour and a half to 18 minutes so I would we might raise that issue tomorrow uh, that perhaps uh, our panel was censored um, looking forward I'm really excited about implementation as Dixie mentioned uh, building on the project on projects out of the rights and principles that connect the responsibilities of platforms uh, e-commerce users responsibilities and the role of intergovernmental organizations I'm also excited about building resources around the internet rights and principles charter uh, such as uh, creating um, an index of supporting material for active activists and for educators on each right uh, on our website uh, and it would be multimedia with uh, text, textual source, text-based sources, videos, memes, etc. Um, I'm also interested in opportunities to uh, monitor and research the impact of the Internet Rights and Principles Charter uh, in uh, different, different ways. So. Uh, I think uh, Marion wants to say say something, and maybe we can open it to the audience. Uh, perhaps we can. I wanted to actually now I'm in a new role. I like to make a motion, if I may. There is um, a letter being circulated and drafted at the moment in the uh, what is called the best bits list, and I think it's going around a number of lists on the tweet on the uh, various social media about what are the dynamic coalitions and related networks who come to the IGF, what is our position on IGF renewal? And I would like to put it to the floor. Does this coalition support move to renew and strengthen the IGF as a space for all sorts of people, interests, groups, stakeholders as we call them, to come together? Do we here in this room, we can check online, support the move to renew and more particularly strengthen the IGF? Do we have any comments on that? I think we do already. Pranesh and... Pranesh? Uh, actually, not uh, as much a comment as uh, much as a question. Uh, what does uh, 
renew actually mean renew for a further term uh, so far the term has been five years uh, renewal for a longer term than that or establishment as a um, ongoing body uh, without a particular time frame. So for the strength, and I, I completely agree, and uh, I think the, the kind of mandate that is laid out in the Tunis agenda is something that it should be strengthened towards. It already gives out a, a gives us a blueprint, and uh, and in a sense even highlights the clearing a house. Uh, uh, kind of vision of the IGF, which was discussed in this very room uh, prior to this workshop. So, uh, I, so yes, to the latter part, but a question for the former about renewal. Thank you for that. Uh, do we have another comment in the back? Yes, <clears throat> Andrei Sherbovich, uh, High School of Economics, National Research University. Uh, just an issue for clarification. Uh, uh, in which way it's possible to join the coalition? Uh, and how to do it with this? Because I would like to uh, support the coalition. Thank you. Yeah, the booklets are here, and we have all the uh, connections to the the email list. So if you go onto our website, you will find it. And if you're not sure, um, email us at info, i n f o at i r p charter dot org. I repeat, info at i r p charter dot org. But you'll find it all in the booklet. We have booklets up the front. So join the list. The list serve is the constituency. So if there's anything to discuss, it happens on the list serve. Yep, thank you. Do join. All right. So um, any other comments from the audience? Yes. Hi, my name is Rachel from Groovy Future. I just wanted to ask about uh, countries, organizations that have signed up to this charter. Well, signed up. Uh, we have endorsements at the back and on the website, so you will see this is, um, the work is wider than the charter. We have some, uh, many organizations that support the spirit of the charter, uh, but are taking a strictly legal point of view, and that's why we had this discussion today. So, of course, uh, are considering whether they want to endorse the charter in its current form, but we do have endorsements. Signing up, we would like to see more. We know there are more, um, so if you have any suggestions, please let us know. Sorry, sorry, Robert. Sorry, I'm, I have to get used to letting Robert do the, do the chairing. Um, uh, I'll manage, I'll manage, you know. Um, I forgot to mention a, a really important thing for the record. The booklet uh, production of the Turkish translation, the Arabic translation, and the, re the fourth edition of the English charter, and the financing to allow us to complete the Spanish charter booklet. The Spanish charter is already up online, but the full booklet in Spanish, we already have Portuguese and Indonesian on the way. Money to support all the lovely blue books you're seeing around here has been provided by Hivos. International and by the Web We Want campaign. So our digital Magna Carta, our Magna Carta for the internet that is here, the global Magna Carta, we're very happy to be working with the Web We Want campaign and we look forward to more synergies there. But without the structural funding, we could not have been able to produce this many booklets and they're nearly all gone. So the ones at the front and here, the last you're going to get a hold of, I'm afraid, because all the rest of the Turkish ones are going to our colleagues here in Turkey. Thank you. Any other um, matters of business uh, within the coalition that you would like to bring up or address? All right, we're gonna we're gonna finish early. This is. This has been a long week already. Um, I want to thank everyone and their interests. I want to urge you to participate in every, any way you can uh, on the listserv. Follow on Twitter. We'll follow you back. Uh, join us on Facebook. Um, email us individually. Um, and we're just really excited about uh, the participation that we've seen here in Turkey and the participation within all stakeholders within the IGF framework. Thank you very much. And also, don't forget, 9 o'clock tomorrow morning, support Turk uh, the Pirate Party movement 
President Turkey and all activists in Turkey, nine o'clock, bring your coffee with you. Thank you. Good night. Does everyone have a copy of the charter? We've got Turkish, we've got English, we've got Arabic. We have charter copies up here. Charter copies here. Please. Please.